What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 wrestlers Vince McMahon never got. We all know Vince McMahon was kind of stuck in his ways. So maybe the wrestling internet community was a big fan of a particular wrestler or even just like a certain wrestler would get over organically with the fans. And Vince McMahon would not see it sometimes. Uh, the person I can think of um, off top is obviously um cesaro cesaro was a a person that organically got over but vince mcmahon didn't really i guess you could say buy into him mainly uh because i think a lot of people were saying because of his promo ability wasn't really that good but his in-ring work was top tier so it for vince it was like he had to look he had the in-ring ability but his microphone skills was not there so he kind of really didn't buy into him as much or push him like a lot of his fans wanted him to be pushed you know and i think there's a way you can work around that you can work to people's strength strengths you know what I'm saying even in situations where it's like they may not be the best talker but you can work with them and find them someone that can be the mouthpiece for them you know and there's been other situations where vince mcmahon didn't really see the potential in that particular wrestler but the fans did so we're gonna check this out appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel let's do the damn thing man when vince mcmahon retired recently there was a huge spat of online discourse about how vinnie mac was this big genius of the wrestling world and perhaps the greatest mind to ever tackle the sport vince mcmahon sure had a lot of big w's in his wrestling career but he also had a lot of huge l's Facts. like massive L's. Yeah. L's so big that King Kong would try and scale them while swatting away biplanes. You <laughs> see, there are a lot of wrestlers in the history of this mad world in which we, the fans, loved and wanted to see pushed to the moon. But Vince McMahon, the supposed genius that he was, didn't get and decided instead to give us more John Cena or whatever stupid gimmick he was into that week. Yep. Guys that could have been big or major players for WWE that would have made massive money, but Vinnie Mac just didn't get. I'm Tempest hailing from Parts Fun Known, and these are 10 wrestlers Vince McMahon never got. And before we get on with our list, make sure that you subscribe and enable notifications to Always On so you never miss a fun wrestling list just like it. And make sure that you watch Survival Series, our new hit show here on Parts Fun Known. I'm a big fan of it, and I think you will be too. Honorable mention, Raven. Fun mm. fact, WWE is the only major company to not have a version of Raven's Flock, an easy-to-book faction that had brilliant main event feuds in ECW and mid-card feuds in TNA and WCW. Yeah. And why didn't WWE have this version of Raven, this silver-tongued devil who had a menagerie of misfits surrounding him to do his bidding? Because Vince McMahon made him a homeless man. <laughs> no, really, Vince McMahon is a f idiot <laughs> number 10 broken matt hardy when mm, both matt and jeff hardy made the return to the house one. that finney mac built in 2017 a lot had changed for brother matthew despite wrestling for two decades by that point in 2016 matt would undergo a drastic character reinvention while working for impact becoming a broken version of himself with a wacky new accent disheveled bleached hair and a whole universe of props and characters mm -hmm. that included a dilapidated boat a mower of lawns and the vanguard one holographic drone all right, maybe it's obvious why Vince McMahon didn't get the character now. Matt would eventually have the opportunity to apply his broken universe to the WWE by the end of 2017, but it was a much less ambitious version of the character than what yeah. we had seen. He played chess with Napoleon, reincarnated as a goldfish, but he wasn't treated with anywhere near the level of importance he was in Impact, losing to Bray Wyatt in a matter of minutes on Raw 25. Yeah. He did get a chance to main event Raw with the ultimate deletion match against Bray, however, that's about as good as it ever got for the WWE version of Broken yep. Matt. Michael Cole, literally before the match started, effectively apologized for what we were about to watch, right there on TV. Damn. Vince McMahon told us that he thought this was shit and you're an idiot if you liked it. And if Damn. that's not enough, on the Talk is Jericho podcast, Matt recalled Vince watching it in the gorilla position and outright saying, I don't get it. So if that's not enough to turn Matt place <laughs> yep. on this list, I don't know what is. Number yeah, nine. Yeah, the broken gimmick. It, it had so much internet appeal and the people were getting behind it. It's just, I don't think... Obviously, Vince wasn't fully behind it. He didn't understand why people were liking it. And when Vince doesn't understand it, even if he may give you a chance, if it doesn't blow him away, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, well, we tried. That's how Vince came off. It's like, eh, if it didn't blow him away, or if he didn't really see just the real impact of it, it had to be shoved in his face by the fans, it was a good chance that he was going to can it. Christian. Similarly to Matt Hardy, 
Christian was someone that gained a lot of success in WWE throughout the company's most successful periods of the late 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. predominantly in the tag division with his kayfabe brother Edge. And, also like Matt Hardy, Vince saw his brother as the biggest star. Yep. While Edge would go on to establish himself as one of the most successful single competitors in company history, Christian would be forced to forge a path outside of WWE to be viewed the same way. Christian would find success across in TNA, uh -huh. winning their big one on two separate occasions. Why did Christian struggle to find similar success in WWE? One contributing factor, Vince thought he was ugly to the point that Vince famously wanted to put a blue dot over Christian's face whenever he was on screen. Wow. And if you ever need more of a reason to believe that Vince McMahon Damn. put on shows just to entertain himself, during the Abraham Washington show in 2009, remember him, Ugh. AW went off on one about how ECW champion Christian was ugly. AW the ventriloquist doll puppeting Vince's madness and revealing to the world why Christian continued to struggle in Vince's Damn, country. I did not know that. Number eight. Dusty Rhodes. Damn. He's like, yo, you ugly, bro. <laughs> That's fucked up. You ugly, ugly, man. I don't believe in you. You're ugly. Damn, Vince. Polka dots. Need I continue? Yeah. Arriving in the WWF in 1989 is one of wrestling's biggest names after hugely mm -hmm. successful stints in the NWA and Jim Crockett promotions in particular, Vince seemed to be out to sabotage the American dream from the word go. The polka dots were perhaps a way to stick it to the man who worked for his competitors for so long, but regardless, Dusty took them in stride and still remained massively over. Yep. Rhodes would unfortunately reach nowhere near the same level of success, however, and would finish his active wrestling career in fairly unmemorable fashion. Dusty was approaching the end of his active in-ring career by the time he arrived in the WWF, so was unlikely to be pushed to the main event during the era of Hulk Hogan yeah, and the Ultimate Warrior. That wouldn't happen. However, his treatment seemed awfully counterproductive for Vince, as he was still such an asset despite his age. Dusty would leave in 1991 to become a booker for WCW, an occasional on-screen character, only eventually returning to work for Vince in 2005. Mm -hmm. This time around, Dusty was rightfully celebrated for his legacy and would become a key figure behind the early days of NXT yep. until his passing in 2015. Rest in peace. Number seven, Cesaro. Ah, in late 2014. I called it. I said it. And I said it in the the video. Cesaro is one of those guys that the fans love, but Vince wasn't really too high up on. I'm sure he appreciated his work, but it's his microphone abilities Vince wasn't a big fan of. Obviously, Cesaro... His microphone abilities, it's it, it could be desired. It's to be desired. You know, it, it's serviceable, but I feel like Vince wanted a, a lot more from him. Teen Vince McMahon appeared on the WWE Network Stone Cold podcast and implored talents such as Cesaro to grab the infamous brass ring. According to McMahon, the reason for Cesaro's lack of a serious push by that point was because he lacked it. Quote unquote, it. Uh -huh. hmm. Yeah, okay, Vince. Let's just ignore the fact that Cesaro was easily one of the most over talents on the roster earlier that same year when he won the Andre the Giant Memorial. And the thing is, he actually, I forgot to mention, he did have mouthpieces around him, too. You know what I'm saying? I think at one point he was aligned with Paul Heyman, and then I believe it, uh, he was aligned with Zeb Coulter, all this other stuff. But it, once again, Vince was just like, nah, I don't get it. I don't see it yet. Memorial Battle Royal. The aforementioned Battle Royal win seemed destined to be the catapult for Cesaro to get to the main event spot that he so rightly deserved, but instead it led to an ill-advised heel run and partnership mm -hmm. with Paul Heyman. While Cesaro could have undoubtedly benefited from having a legendary mouthpiece like Heyman by his side, he always felt like an afterthought to Brock Lesnar throughout this run and was never quite Heyman's main attraction. Yeah. In the years following this, Cesaro would achieve success, most notably perhaps as one half of the bar with Sheamus, but he would only get very minuscule tastes of the main event scene prior to his departure in 2022. Cesaro had all the tools to become a main event presence in WWE. Curse you, Vince. Yeah. You are the one that dropped the ball. Number six, Diamond Dallas Page. Mm. Following WWE's victory in the Monday Night Wars against WCW, it was inevitable that Vince would look to ingest as much of the former competition's talent as he could to bolster his roster. That is, if their contract wasn't too big, in which case, by all means, sit out. However, as we've already learned, Vince McMahon is a very, very petty man. Very and when petty, it came yep. to the WCW roster, it was evident that he rarely ever wanted them to look as strong as his WWF loyalists. Yep. There was perhaps no greater example of this than Diamond Dallas Page. A WCW mainstay and former three-time world heavyweight champion, Page was a perennial babyface and an unlikely star for Ted Turner's company. So, given the popularity of Page, what kind of character would Vince McMahon design for Page's eventual debut? Any guesses? Well, if you said <laughs> creepy voyeuristic stalker, yep. you are correct. Bafflingly. 
Page debuted as the mystery stalker of The Undertaker's then wife, Sarah, who had been the subject of unsettling video camera recording vignettes for months. <laughs> After revealing his identity on the June 18th, 2001 episode of Raw, to a massive pop, by the way, yeah. DDP revealed he only stalked Taker's wife to get to the dead man, who proceeded to destroy Page in the subsequent feud. And that was yeah. that, really. Yep. Page went on to do not much else of note in his short WWE tenure, save for a brief run with the European Championship, before sadly being forced to retire due to a neck injury in April 2002. The real kicker here is that Page took a massive pay cut to come to the WWF for Damn. the invasion. He could have sat on his Turner contract like Hall, Nash, Goldberg, and Hogan did, but he wanted to wrestle for Vince. And this is how Vince repaid that's, him for that's it. Kind Number of five. Up. Taz. Oh, Taz is definitely deserved to be another popular act from a rival company, Taz, despite a relatively small stature, was a man to be feared during his time in ECW. Mm -hmm. The human suplex machine was a legit badass that carried himself as such and would become one of Paul Heyman's biggest success stories, winning pretty much every title he had to offer across a six-year spell in ECW. Taz's WWF debut at the 2000 Royal Rumble might be the most perfect wrestling debut ever. He came out to a huge New York pop. Mm -hmm. He destroys the unbeaten Kurt Angle and puts him to sleep with an illegal chokehold. But the problem was he came from ECW, yep. which means Vince took one look at him and said, well, you're the hardcore guy now then. Uh -huh. So Taz went from beating the unbeatable future WWF champion to feuding with the big boss man and Prince Albert. Next thing you know, that's it for Taz. He teamed with fellow ex-ECW alumni Raven for a forgettable tag run, and then, just one year after an incredible debut in the Rumble, he was eliminated from the 2001 Royal Rumble in a matter of seconds with a sign that said, my crap is bigger than Taz, which Damn. might as well have been written by Vince McMahon himself. As previously mentioned, Taz was not the biggest individual, and in the land of the Giants, this is always likely to work against you. After yep. numerous injuries, Taz would successfully transition to commentary and become a staple of the SmackDown booth alongside Michael Cole. As good as Taz was and still is at commentary, it is hard not to ask what if when it came to his in-ring WWE career. Oh, Taz was a... Uh... Fantastic and still pretty, you know, pretty good uh, on commentary. It's just we know they didn't Vince. It, it, it's it's the Vince show. It's what he sees, where you came from. He's gonna put you in that category, and that's pretty much it. You either make it work or oh well, good luck. Number four, Zack Ryder. When it comes to who oh, gets pushed yeah. in WWE, very rarely did Vince McMahon not have 99.99% of the same old, things. Bro. So, if you're not seen as a star in his eyes, I hope you enjoy sitting in catering, pal. Nobody perhaps fit this bill more than Zack Ryder, mm -hmm. or maybe Primo or JTG. For real, it felt like those two were employed forever. And to Zack Ryder's credit, however, he was not simply content with languishing away. Instead, he would start up he his very own YouTube channel over. and begin a that series so known crazy. as Z True Long Island Story. The series garnered Ryder a massive following throughout 2011, leading to fans hijacking shows with We Want Ryder chants mm -hmm. until WWE were forced to take notice. Now you've got to remember, this was before YouTube was this major thing that it is now, and wrestling Twitter was still in its infancy. However, we were hastily reminded that more often than not, if you go against the will of Vince McMahon and get yourself over organically without WWE's backing, yep. you'll duly be brought back down to earth. Despite throwing up. Ryder a bone by giving him a United States Championship run in late 2011, he was well and truly dismantled. And <laughs> I had to. I knew this was going to be the image. Once they threw him off the stage with a neck brace, I, I knew he was dead. He was done. That whole Eve Torres and John Cena storyline, I, I knew he was finished. Vince was done with him. He got over organically without WWE help only for him to get pushed off the stage into oblivion. Humiliated on TV constantly in early 2012. Look at Specifically that. throughout John Cena's rivalry with Kane and on-screen romance with Eve Torres. Yep. The icing on the cake was getting kicked square in the gonads by Torres at WrestleMania 28, effectively extinguishing the rider fire for good and sending him back to catering for eight more years. WWE spent all of 2011 burying Twitter because guys like Ryder got over because of it. Yep. Then fast forward one year and they're slapping the trending sticker over the end of an era segment like that's what matters at that moment. Had Ryder gotten himself over on tout, maybe things would have been different. Number three, Cold. The Fiend. After six oh, years of yeah. character mismanagement, the spring of 2019 saw a true revival for Bray Wyatt. 
no longer the swamp dwelling cult leader, and instead a children's TV show host carrying Which extremely unsettling undertones, fantastic. the birth of the Firefly Funhouse was a breath of fresh air for Bray and WWE. Though it should be noted that the Firefly Funhouse was literally born out of those six years of bad booking. Uh -huh. At the center of all of it, however, was Bray's new alter ego, The Fiend who provided one of the most truly unsettling character designs in wrestling history and gave Bray a new horror villain character that was simply indestructible. That is, unless you're going up against a 53-year-old Goldberg. Brother. Oh yes, in what is still arguably one of the worst booking decisions of all time, The oh Fiend God, was fed to bro. Oldberg after months of dominance. Just baffling. Awful. Proving precisely why The Fiend should have been kept away from the title scene in the first place, yep. the mystique of the character was damaged beyond repair at that yep. point. And that was a few months after the Hell in a Cell debacle. And it's not even getting into the maddening Randy Orton storyline <sighs> that went on for months and had no satisfying conclusion outside of Randy Orton squashing The Fiend at WrestleMania. Absolutely atrocious for such a creative character for Vince McMahon, the supposed creative genius, to have no idea how to book him. Vince and Bray notoriously clashed creatively very often, which would eventually lead to Wyatt getting released and receiving the difficult to work with label, mm -hmm. effectively meaning that Bray simply called McMahon out for his garbage creative. Thank God this wasn't the final chapter for Wyatt in WWE, yep. as it once seemed to be. Number and two. I'm so glad that he's, you know, he's able to kind of, you know, have his creative freedom, but they don't let him go too overboard, you know what I'm saying? And I, and I like what they're doing with him now, man. I've said this time and time again. Bray Wyatt should have never been a one to go for the title. That's not his MO. His MO is never when when they created the break the the fiend gimmick, it wasn't for him to go after the title. It should have been for him to rain terror on everyone. You know what I'm saying? I, I it would have it would have made sense. Kept him from the title scene for a little bit. You know what I'm saying? At some point, maybe put him in the mix. But once again, a character like that doesn't really need the title to be over. You know what I'm saying? So, but either way, hey, you know, things happen for a reason. And now we have Bray doing what he's doing now. Dean Ambrose. This is another John Moxley flourish in AEW as a no nonsense, foul mouth badass has truly shown just how much WWE and Vince McMahon missed the mark with his character. Despite showing glimpses of his current best, the WWE version of Dean Ambrose always felt like a bit of a caricature. Yeah. Ambrose was labeled as unhinged and a lunatic, but often came off as a bit corny and not a balanced blending of the character and the real person at times. Mm -hmm. And when WWE attempted to change Ambrose's character after many years with his 2008 18 heel turn it was so dreadfully botched that it provided they, the nail in the coffin up, for bro. ambrose's wwe tenure what could have been the catalyst to see ambrose lose the shackles and show that rougher side instead saw him get dressed up as a wish version of bane Facts. and get inoculations on camera to protect himself from the wwe universe yeah had it been a year and a half later he might have been onto something Rewatching that segment in particular though is painfully evident just how bad mox knew the material he was given was nothing more than the creatively devoid you people are disgusting heel heat that was yeah. so beneath mox's that talent was so just lame. let mox be <laughs> mox vince why did you have to make everything so lame and number one, almost every NXT call up ever. There we go. Carrying Cross, Keith Lee, The there Ascension, Tyler Breeze, Bobby Roode, Keep The going. Revival, Rusev, yep. Ty Dillinger, yep. Alistair Black, yep. Andrade, EC3, yep. The Viking yep. Raiders, Sanity, yep. AOP, Hit yep. Row, yep. American Alpha, Hideo yep. Itami, Pete Dunn. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Breathe. Probably forgetting a few, but Shana. is there anything yep. more to say there? Nope. While there have been numerous NXT alumni that have successfully made the transition to a Vince McMahon-led main roster, the number of botched call-ups <laughs> is truly staggering. And while some have stuck around or found their way back to the company recently, so many have slipped through WWE's grasp, which is a huge shame. The sheer frustration caused in seeing a character being developed for years in NXT, only to be completely gutted on the main roster was painful. Some were given helmets. Oh some were gosh. given totally random nicknames. Yeah. Bearcat, anyone? And some were made a mute, like EC3, because of, you know, reasons, I guess. Vince almost certainly got some sort of sick pleasure from the whole thing. That truly evil man. <laughs> Thankfully, NXT is no longer treated like the ugly stepchild of the WWE, and things are looking up. The reign of McMahon terror is over. Long live the McMahon Helmsley con era, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. That sounds about right. WWE. WWE, WWE, 
And that's our list. Did we forget? Hey, he he was spot on with the number one spot. All in it, most the majority of the NXT call ups have been fucking underutilized, but some of them are being able to you know fix their uh, fix their uh, character development. And hopefully going forward, any more NXT call ups won't have to deal with just being instantly screwed over and damn near buried before you even actually get a chance to show your talents to more of the casual audience man so comment down below let me know which wrestler you feel like vince truly dropped the ball on if they were on this list or not on this list or mentioned let me know down below but i appreciate all the love and support you guys are showing on the channel road to 150k appreciate y'all kicking with me see y'all next one peace